began a new course, Women in Ministry, course 109 in the new course code, and we thank the Lord for laying out a prologue and introduction for us in the previous lesson. And right now in this uh, particular lesson, we're going to build on the foundation of what was released yesterday. This course is so important because it addresses some of the misconceptions that have been you know, prevalent and is based on a twist away from the purpose of the Father because of lack of context. And so by the grace of the Lord, we're going to be dealing a holistic dealing on the subject matter. And this lesson today helps us in the sense that it begins to introduce us to God's perspective of womanhood and it's the service of women to Yeshua is a little bit introduced. It's going to be exposited in a later lesson. And then the synopsis of what we're going to cover is brought forth in this lesson. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to posture before you to receive light from your word. Let your spirit have preeminence and bring forth the mind that you ordain to be written in your holy word. Thank you for the answer. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. So, lesson two of women in ministry, we're going to discuss today the two covenants, women, ministry of women to Yeshua Jesus and the synopsis. In discussing women and their capacity to receive the call to ministry, pursue and fulfill the same, it's necessary to state with clarity that the Old Testament and religious veils thereof may not provide us sufficient light. The success of vessels such as Deborah and Esther we reference in the previous lessons in the previous lesson were exceptions because Israel was under a culture which distorted Elohim's purpose right from the early days in the wilderness when the Torah was given. The day the Torah was given if you read Exodus chapter 19, from verse 3 to verse 8, Elohim's purpose was not to create a religious system that will keep people away from him. On the other hand, he said clearly in verse 5 of Exodus 9, Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, then you shall become, you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation, Wow. Men and brethren, can you imagine that was his purpose? That anywhere you saw a Jew worldwide, the life of the Jew will point to him. But as we know, Israel could not handle the glory of his presence through inbred sin, stubbornness of heart, and tendency to drift into idolatry at the least excuse, which is the highest expression of spiritual immorality. The outcome was religion marked by a number of features. We're given this introduction for you to know where this whole battle against womanhood comes from concerning whether women can be in ministry or not. It's not just what Paul said to the Ephesians and to the Corinthians. There is a root, and that's where the Lord wants to take us in this lesson. So the outcome of religion was, number one, a veil was placed on Moses' face, which ultimately covered the ability to receive the truth. Two, Moses became a mediator as the people could not relate freely with Elohim, they needed to pass through him. He was the step-down transformer that Elohim spoke to Moses, then Moses spoke to the people. Three, in a, in ultimately, because of their inability to have a personal relationship with Yahweh, the Torah became an instrument of religion and a culture of rituals and dead works performed inside religious buildings on certain holy days. That's what happened both in the tabernacle of witness and in the temple. Four, the institution of the ironic Levitical priesthood, which ministered to the holy things of the tabernacle, was limited to healthy male sons as a priestly, you know, professional priestly caste. So this is the very wet religion led to. So with the passage of time, people of Israel interpreted the Torah with hardened hearts. Result was a tendency to use religion as a cordial of oppression rather than a catalyst of liberty. And Yeshua showed his displeasure with the development when he rebuked the religious leaders in Matthew 19, 
in Mark 3, 5, in Mark 6, 52, he talked about the hardness of heart. And then in Matthew 23, he unveiled the utter worthlessness of religion that is driven by hardness of heart and external shows of piety. Paul the Apostle then spoke about this in 2 Corinthians 3, 12, seeing that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded. For unto this day remained the veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Yeshua. The veil is done away in Yeshua. So every Sabbath day, the Jews just got in the synagogue. And what do they do? They take the Pasha, the Torah script for the day. The scribe reads it just like that. No light. The veil is still there. But Yeshua took it away. Men and brethren, as far back as the time of the prophets, Elohim declared in Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 that he found little value in religious rituals done inside buildings of brick and mortar and preferred to relate with those whose hearts were right with him. By the time of Jeremiah, in 31 of his, the book after his name, Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, the Lord said, Hey! I'm going to make a new covenant, not after the old. This one, I'm going to write my laws in the hearts of the people. It was to be a covenant whereby all souls have access to the Father through the blood of Yeshua. Because the veil was rent when he said it is finished. And in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19, we are told, Having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by a new and living way, which had consecrated to us through the veil that is say his flesh. And then the high priest he was were now urged to come. Everybody, male, female, young, old is come. So what are we saying? The core mindset of those who oppose women in ministry is that they are wrapped up in the old covenant context of priesthood, which will be expanded further in the course of this resource. The old covenant priesthood was only for males who descended from Aaron, the first high priest. They were assisted by their brethren from the tribe of Levi to minister in the holy things of temple-based worship. And just as Yeshua fulfilled the old covenant and said it is finished, so also he fulfilled the Aaronic priesthood, we're going to discuss it as we said, and instituted a radically new priesthood called the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. No longer will people serve Elohim on the basis of just their lineage or gender, but according to his purpose, evidenced by the call on all believers in the new covenant. All believers are called, and the anointing of Holy Spirit and manifestation of spiritual gifts define what the Lord wants to do through anyone. And therefore, brethren, ministry in the new covenant context is the expression of what we are impressed with by Holy Spirit. Whatever he put in us, when we bring it forth, that's ministry. And that is the simplest definition of ministry. But let's look at the divine science of a new paradigm for women in the new covenant. You see, many religious leaders skim the surface of the new covenant, and they miss most of the meat and bones. The stock answer given for wanting women to stay out of ministry is this. First they say, Jesus called only women. I mean, called only men. Men and brethren, Yeshua indeed called only 12 men and spent three and a half years processing them. But it was because of their special role. They were not the only disciples of Yeshua. I wanted to take note of this. The 12 were people he was going to commit assignments and they were required to be full time. Whatever you were doing, fisherman, come, leave all, come. Matthew, tax collector, leave all, come. Everybody, leave all and come. There were other disciples. Joseph of Arimantia was a disciple, but his assignment was not to leave all and come. He was to remain in his business. He was to grow in stature, have access to Pontius Pilate, because the day will come when his assignment will be needed, which is to ask for the body of Yeshua to bury in his own grave to fulfill prophecy. There were other disciples. Men, women, young, old, even the young man, Mark, who was a teenager, who they tried to grab him, he ran away naked. He was a disciple. 
Amen and brethren, it's so important to know that the twelve he called, he called them and they were like in a boot camp with them. He stayed with them. They lived with him. And so women could not be in that context. This is so important. If you look at Mark 3, 13 to 19, it tells you he went to a mountain and called to him those whom he would. It was because of that special assignment. Not everybody who had that special assignment. Everybody has assignment. Reading texts like this and staying fixated on the gender of the twelve apostles can miss the whole point. There is much more to the mission of Yeshua which the Christian church has neither explored nor yet received a revelation of. We believe the Lord will use this resource to plug such holes. The new covenant was in the person of Yeshua, his life and ministry, sealed by his blood at the cross, confirmed with his resurrection on the third day. For this reason, the immortal Elohim needed a body as an instrument of fulfilling his purpose. If you get to Hebrews 10, from verse 1 all the way to 10, it tells you that body would become ordinary, human, needing to eat food, first needing to be conceived, needing to be nurtured for 30 years, eat food. It wasn't, it wasn't a spirit, it was a body. He needed food, he needed shelter, he needed support. In their support for his mission. It will be a body that the sins of the whole world will be placed for the redemption of humanity to be possible. And the dead body needed to be cared for, washed over. And on the resurrection morning, somebody needed to bear witness that indeed he had rose from the dead. Listen, Elohim doesn't do anything without a reason. So, in that regard, even though later in this resource we're going to be discussing the role of women in the ministry of Yeshua, the Lord impressed on our hearts at this very first early beginning to outline a few things. Number one, the incarnation of that body that was to be prepared for the sake of redemption was through a woman, Mary. The only person who knew when the incarnation took place was Mary. If you read scripture, Luke one twenty six to 35, and you see that the prophecy of the seed of the woman in the book of Genesis 3.15 and Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of time was come, Elohim sent his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that woman received the adoption of sons. And if you check very well, Joseph didn't know when the incarnation took place. It's only when the signs of the pregnancy of Mary was evident. They began to say, what's happening? I'm pregnant. But what happened? Holy Ghost came upon me. And then the rest is history. And he didn't do what he wanted to do as a human. Number two, a diligent examination of the Holy Scriptures reveals that it was mainly who women who principally funded the ministry of Yeshua. The funding. <laughs> you think ministry partnership starts today? No. Yeshua had ministry partners. Luke chapter 8. He came to pass afterwards. He went throughout every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of Elohim. The twelve were with him. The twelve were with him. Now the question is, Yeshua and twelve men, thirteen people, how were they taken care of? Food was not dropping from heaven. Food was not coming from the ground. Look at the answer. Verse 2. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, women, which ministered unto him of their substance. They were grateful for what had happened. Impartation received, healing received, and they used their finances to minister to him. Men and brethren, don't forget that Mary and Martha, number three, with their brother Lazarus, were variously presented as preparing meals for Yeshua, and he was their regular guest. He went to their home to, to refresh. At the end of a busy day, he went to their place, and there they ate. Their relationship with him was very close. Luke chapter 10 and chapter uh, John chapter 11 give us details. In John 12, Mary Magdalene showed total consecration and commitment even to anointing Yeshua for his imminent death and using her hair to wipe 
as a towel, showing the absolute commitment and consecration in John 12, from verse 1 to verse 8. Number five, women were principal witnesses to the last breath of Yeshua. While the men, except John, ran away, Peter, of course, had denied his master. The men were nowhere to be found. The, sh the shepherd had been smitten. The sheep had scattered. Only John came close. And the women were there. If you look at John 19, we are told that Mary, his mother, was there. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clophas, Mary Magdalene was there. And Yeshua addressed Mary. Say, look at John. He will take care of you, son, as a son. And John that. Man and brethren, if you even look at all that Matthew 27, 54 to 56, it made it clear that they were there till the end, woman. In Mark 15, from verse 40, they were there till the end, men and brethren. And number six, though dead, the devotion of the women were consistent. They bought spices to preserve his body so that he would not see corruption. Mark 16. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, first day of the day, they came to the sepulchre at the rising of the sun devotion even beyond life number seven it was a woman mary magdalene who was the first to see the risen yeshua you see peter would have had the privilege peter and john but they pulled back when they didn't find they went back home it was a woman who came and stood weeping asking what she thought was the gardener desiring to see her master yeshua appeared and called her mary she shouted Rabboni, brothers and sisters. You know, this cause we believe that the special role of women in these phases of the redemptive mission of Yeshua was not accidental, but a carefully designed process by which Elohim was making a bold statement. That his sons in female bodies were marked out to be active participants in the new covenant, which is far superior to the old. It was not by accident that Yeshua is called seed of the woman. It's not accidental. It's not just a theological phrase because he the Elohim ensured it happened. So, considering these biblical facts, let's just get ready and get into the scriptures. We're going to see what Paul said. We're going to see why he said it. And we're going to see other scriptures that show that he didn't mean a woman should just stay in the home cooking food and making babies. And dressing up the living room for others to come and stay. So the synopsis of this course is going to include coverage of these things, not in any particular order, but we're going to answer these questions. One, what are the scriptures which some religious leaders and organizations lay hold of to insist that women should have no public role or exercise leadership in the church? What are they? So we're going to head on going to them and show you what is said and the context is said it, and the issues around them. Two, what were the contents in which those instructions were given? Then the question is, do those instructions negate the basic operating system of the royal priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, which is that every believer born again is called? Three, are females who are redeemed by the blood of Yeshua supposed to perpetually carry the stigma of Eve and on that basis live with inherited guilt all the days of their lives? Four, we're going to look at the kingdom concept of ministry. Five, in what way did Yeshua relate with women, which was deemed as absolutely revolutionary for the generation he lived in? We're going to look at that. And six, did Paul recognize, receive, and promote the ministry of women? Did he receive the ministry of women? Did he recognize them? Did he commend them? Seven, are redeemed females who spiritually are sons of Elohim in female bodies supposed to just marry, work a job, bear, and raise children, and attend church service to be told how to cook well, how to take care of husbands, raise children, and allow only the men to do the work of ministry? Is that the intention of the Most High? Eight, as there are some functions, callings, and ministries that are no-go areas for women on account of assumed defects that have to do with the agenda. Nine, is this an abomination? As some say, 
for a woman to head a ministry where men are? Is it an abomination? Is it abominable? Ten, what are the, what are the biblically sound constraints which women in ministry who are married should consider? So, men and brethren, please share the video. Get people to come in. Those who can come at this time of the life teaching, praise the Lord. But not all can because of work and other commitments. So, share the video so that people, in their spare time, they can take 30 minutes to watch and check the references by themselves. Brothers and sisters, this is the fourth edition. Since we began teaching this course, this fourth edition, there will be some tweaks here and there to make sure that, you know, the message is clearer and anybody, anywhere, as all the courses the Lord gave to us, whether you are in the most extreme part of Asia or United States of America, or Australia or Africa or Europe, anywhere you are in the world, just understand and begin to affect your environment with the truth. Contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You have a sphere of influence. Get to know the truth. Then take the truth. Run with it. And use it to influence other people so that the frontiers of darkness shall be pushed aside. We're going to tell you the agenda of Satan. We're going to bring statistics about proportion of men and women in different nations of the world. And to see the grand scheme of Satan, which is to hobble the church, take out 50% or 60%, in some cases 70% of the potential workforce of the kingdom. We're going to understand that. By way of assignment, number one, please summarize this chapter, this uh, lesson. Two, specify the seven things which Elohim used women to do in the life of Yeshua and the significance of them. Just short bullet point kind of summary. Three, what personal message are you taking away from this lesson? Brothers and sisters, I believe that the Lord has spoken by way of introduction and if you will just Make yourself available. For the two weeks or so it will take us to deliver this course. The Lord will equip you what it takes. And if you are a woman, you will be reaffirmed in the purpose of the Lord. Are you a man who is doubtful? Like I said, even here in London, some people are like, you know, should women be leaders? So don't think that it's everywhere. Don't think it's only in your corner. It's everywhere. But the Lord said to everybody, go back to my world. Study under the unction of Holy Spirit. Study systematically. A little here, a little there. See the overall picture so that you can know where to go. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to receive this word today. We hand over to you that your spirit will do what you intend to be done. Have your way in our hearts. Possess our minds. As you plow our hearts and plant the seed of the word, let it bring forth fruit thirtyfold, sixtyfold, hundredfold to your own glory and praise. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching, and we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook Monday all the way to Sunday every day by about 10.30 a.m. UK time and that's the same at Nigerian time and you, it's either Apostle George Monday to Friday uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace uh, Friday to Sunday and then in the evening of Sunday we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6 after 6 another one up to 7 so please join us on the live stream and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website www.gsom.ac to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, ebooks. You can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want you can also if you want to do the yes course or be, do the master class you can go to www.kingdomboostclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it you can also subscribe to our channels this youtube gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at akclife.tv at gmail.com 
We love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of Yeshua, Jesus, is empowered with truth. Remember, it is the teach, train, equip, activate and release paradigm. Absolutely free of charge. Have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon.